Exodus chapter 33, Moses understood the importance, the significance. Obviously, he understood the significance of the word of God. But Moses also knew the significance, the importance of the presence of God. And I know many of you are familiar in, in Exodus uh, 33, Moses told the Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us, we're not going. I mean, he, he was just determined. There was three million, <laughs> three million Jews out there. And Moses said, we're not taking another step. I mean, we're all going to be just frozen here. We're going to be freeze framed right here in this moment on the backside of this desert unless we know that your presence goes with us and before us. That's how important it was to Moses. He knew that's how important it was. And God's response was, my presence will go with you. My presence will go with you. It will go with you, and you'll find rest. Well, there's rest in God's presence. In Psalm chapter 16, uh, verse 11, the psalmist says, I, uh, you, O oh God, will show me the path of life, and in your presence is the fullness of joy, and at your right hand pleasures forevermore. And I think if we could just be committed, if we could just commit ourselves to be just as determined as Moses, and, and just decide that, Lord, somehow by your grace, Help us every day, every moment of the day, at least every conscious moment of the day. Help us, Lord God, to live outside of your presence. To be men and women that live outside, you know what I'm saying? That live within and out of his presence. That we live within and out of his presence. That we're husbands that way and we're wives that way and we're parenting our kids, not in our own strength, but we have that same prayer that Moses prayed. God, I'm going to parent these children. I'm going to go to this job. I'm going to do my, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to fulfill my career. I'm going to be the husband. I'm going to be the wife. But boy, unless your presence goes with me, I'm not going. I can't do a thing. I need your presence. I need to live from without of that, outside of that. It needs to come out of that as an overflow, you know. And I think if we just commit ourselves to that, to the word of God and the presence of God, folks. And what, I, uh, what I'm so thankful for is uh, evenings like this where we've committed ourselves to come and be here. A lot of, I mean, this is a busy time of the year. There's a lot of, I mean, it's, now's the time of the year where everybody's shopping. They're trying to get that done before the last minute. And, and, and it gets dangerous at the last minute. I used to be a Christmas Eve shopper in my 20s. And then I learned real quick, that is a bad time to shop. So there's a lot going on. But you and I, we've committed to be here tonight. I mean, we showed up on purpose, right? We didn't like stumble in like, where are we? I mean, we came here on purpose. And we came here because we're hungry for the presence of God and we're hungry for the word of God and we're hungry to experience God. I mean, we're celebrating Christmas where heaven ultimately, I mean, uh, I mean, quint quintessentially, heaven came to earth. This is Christmas. Heaven came to earth. Heaven came to the earth in the form of a son. God's son in the form of a baby, a child, an infant. Mary gave birth. Heaven came to earth. Gabriel said, heaven's coming to earth. After 400 years of silence, God had been silent for 400 years. And he said, now it's time. And it's still time. 2,000 years later, it's still time. It's still time to experience redemption and healing and restoration and joy and peace and love and power. It's still time. That time isn't over. It's still time. And heaven is still here. Heaven still has come to the earth. And Jesus said, I'm leaving now the earth. He was the heaven personified, but he says, I'm going to send him, the Holy Spirit, and then he's coming to the earth, and he's going to stay here until all of this is wrapped up. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never abandon you. Heaven has come to earth. I'm so thankful for that. We need God's presence, don't we? 
and it's here. But Lord, help us to live within it. Help us to live out of it. So that what we do and what we say and how we relate to each other and the kind of husbands and wives we are and the kind of young men and women we are, may we, may we do all of that out of your presence. That your presence is the thing that carries us and protects us and sustains us and guides us and directs us and speaks to us. And that heaven speaks through us and moves through us. Thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Can we thank the Lord one more time, everybody? All right. Man, thank you for being here tonight. Good to see everybody. Can you hug? You don't have to hug them. If you're a little weird about it, just shake their hand or high-five them or something. If you want to hug them, you can. You can do that. Good. Thank you, worship team. Okay, the worship team's going to come, going to be coming back here in a few moments. I wanted to take a couple of moments and share with you uh, uh, a passage of scripture here uh, found in First Corinthians ch- chapter eleven. And so, it, 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 you probably know most of you that are here tonight have been have been a part of the Heaven Come services. If you're here for the first time, what will happen is we're going to Take a few moments. We're going to look at the scriptures. We're going to continue with our time of worship after that. Um, we do have a couple of folks being baptized tonight, which is awesome. And uh, this Sunday is our made new service, which is a baptism. We do this every other month. Obviously, we've been having baptisms all the time, but, but these are our designated times. And I think we already have, I think, 20 or so uh, signed up for that, which you know, when we were doing them every other month, it was 30 or 40. We've been doing them all the time, and it's still it's like 20. And I think that's amazing. God is doing something in people's hearts and lives. And, and I, a lot of times I feel like he, he's doing it. Obviously, he's doing it in us and through us, right? But don't you feel sometimes he's kind of like there's times he, it feels like he's doing it in spite of us? Am I alone in that? Does anybody else feel that way? Hello, y'all here? Of course you're here. I'm looking at you. That's a silly question. That was a silly question. But sometimes I feel like, it, you know, God is doing these incredible things sometimes even in spite of us. So, um, so uh, and then for the offering, what we'll do is we'll, we'll re- uh, as you're leaving, uh, there'll be buckets in the, in the back. If you're giving cash, you can give online as well. And what we have been doing is all of the offerings from our Heaven Come services, our Wednesday evening services, we've been giving those, those offerings away to either local churches in the area or local ministries in the area. Now, we did make an exception last week, and that offering went towards Nikki Cruz, and that's where we were Sunday. Uh, he was uh, at Times Square Church, which was started by David Wilkerson, who is the one that led Nikki to the Lord. And, um, and so... Uh, uh, they had a you know a celebration for Nikki uh, as he turned 80, uh, and and uh, Bonnie and I did not realize how historic of an event that was going to be. Uh, it was pretty pretty significant, and we felt really honored and privileged to to be there and be a part of it. But uh, Nikki's been preaching for 60 years, and the man that's pastoring Times Square Church now. Uh, Pastor David Wilkerson, who started it, uh, was, was, was uh, in a car accident, I think, in 2011 and lost his life, went home to be with the Lord. It was sudden. It was tragic. This uh, pastor, uh, uh, was it Carter? Huh? Yeah, Carter, Pastor Carter Conlon, Conlon is now the pastor there. And, and he, he was sharing some things that just kind of put it in perspective. Um, he, he made a statement. He quoted Billy Graham. And he said, uh, and Billy Graham was talking about Nikki Cruz, and this was later in Billy Graham's life, much, much later. Um, Nikki had been preaching for, I don't know, decades by this time, I think. And Billy Graham made the statement that uh, Nikki Cruz's conversion was probably one of the most significant conversions in the 20th century because of the number of people that he's reached. He's preached to 55 million people. 
in his life in 60 years. Over 100 different countries. He's still preaching. Um, he hasn't slowed down. And so that was really powerful. Um, and, and it was really amazing to, uh, to be there and, um, and, and to be able to, to honor uh, Nikki and his life and his ministry. Um, and so we gave an offering is what I'm trying to say. We took last Wednesday's offering and, and it came uh, to about $2,000. So we, we gave that to Nikki Cruz Outreach Ministries as a gift from New Life Church. And so that was a blessing. So can we thank the Lord for that? Thank you for your generosity. I'm gonna, I want to share from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 just briefly here. I want to talk about uh, the Lord's table again. That's one of the cornerstones of, of, of what's been happening here at New Life Church in our Wednesday evening Heaven Come services. And, and even in our Sunday services, of course, it's it spilled over to that. And, uh, and this is, as far as the weekly Heaven Come services, this is the second to the last one for 2018. Uh, then in uh, next year, 2019, uh, we will be doing um, uh, one service, one Wednesday night a month. But it will not be like we were doing it before. The first, you know, like uh, first Wednesdays, uh, we're praying and believing and trusting that the Spirit of God is going to continue to move. And even if we're doing it, even as we're doing it once a month, once a month, um, uh, it's they're going to be heaven come services. We're going to baptize folks. We're going to see people come to Jesus. We're going to worship God. We're going to minister. You're going to invite friends, right? And we're just going to see God continue to move in us. And so I am excited about these last two uh, Wednesday nights uh, tonight and then next Wednesday. Now, next Wednesday, I already know what I'm going to share with you. And, it, and I think it's, I, I believe it's really important for us. I believe it is a word uh, from the scriptures and from the Lord for us as New Life Church, specifically or particularly for 2019, okay? And I really believe God has something that he's laid on my heart that he wants me to share with us that we're meant to carry into this next year. Uh, and, and so I hope that you can uh, make it back uh, next, uh, next Wednesday night. And, uh, and, of course, it has been humbling. It's been amazing. Listen, God has done some incredible things these, uh, I mean, I don't know how many months it's been, July, July, August, July, August, September, October, November, six. Is that right? I'm horrible at math. Five? It's been five? Why has it been five? Why hasn't it been six? July? Oh, July. And then December. Yeah, but it's going to be six months, yeah. All right, I'm sorry, Bonnie and I are talking. This is, <laughs> these are our conversations at home. <laughs> this is how it goes at home. No, that's not right. No, it is. What are you talking about? I'm confused. And then I tell her, do you know who I am? And she's like, no, really, I hit my head. I don't remember. Who am I? No, I'm just kidding. That's the joke that we have at the house. We actually tell that joke to each other at the, at the house just, you know. But it's really been amazing these last six months. <laughs> what God has done, I know there's a lot of us here in this room that God has radically impacted your life through these Heaven Come services. I know that. Families have been impacted. Uh, we've seen people come to Jesus. We've, been, we've seen people physically healed. We've seen people healed spiritually we've seen people who were scattered outside of the church who have been hurt and wounded and bruised brought back home again and sitting at the table again and back in the house of the Lord and back with God's people isn't that beautiful I mean I just all of those things have been happening and it's it's been really just by the grace of God and so obviously baptisms and, and communion have been a very uh, significant uh, part of this at which at first I was like okay I'm not really sure but then I'm thinking wait a minute and I've said it so many times that these are the only two things that Jesus himself instituted and the two things that he said keep doing them make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit and then as far as the Lord's table he said as often as you do this do this in remembrance of me he basically said these are two things I did myself I want you to do it with me now I'm going to leave and I want you to keep doing them <laughs> I want you to make disciples and baptize them. Amen. And I want you to come to my table. 
And we're going to talk about a little bit more about the Lord's table right now. I'm going to take a few moments. And then as I get, uh, as I get ready to, as we get almost done with that, I'm going to ask the, those that are being baptized uh, uh, to, to go ahead and, and get ready and make their way over to that side. And, of course, once we're done looking at the scriptures here, the worship team will come back. The communion tables are open in the front and in the back. But I think as we worship at his table tonight, God's going to show us yet another facet to this beautiful experience, this means of grace that he's made available to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So I want to take a look at that passage of Scripture. And there's a couple of things that I want us to see here that I feel like is important for us to see. One is uh, one of the things is just a reminder for us. Another thing that I want to mention uh, is a misconception that I think we often have about this passage. So I want to talk about the first aspect of this, where it says, let a man or a woman examine himself. And that word examine me, literally means like, you're, like you would do a diagnostic test or whatever on a car or on the engine of a car. Or a doctor would do run test on somebody's body to see if there's anything wrong. That's literally what Paul is talking about, that when we come to the table, it's an opportunity for us to examine ourselves. It's a perfect opportunity to receive forgiveness. It's a perfect opportunity to repent. It's the perfect opportunity to drink in and receive God's blessing and God's mercy and God's grace and God's forgiveness. But we want to be able to examine ourselves and realize where we're at. Let the Holy Spirit show us what, listen, what He needs to do in us at His table tonight. Do I need to forgive? Do I have some areas in my life that need to be adjusted? Am I thinking incorrectly about something and I need to adjust my thinking or what I'm believing? Or do I need to adjust what I'm saying? Are my words hurtful? Am I crass? Is, is my communication not full of grace and peace? Do I have a tendency to be critical? I'm just using examples here. But Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit to show you. He, he needs to show us as we go to His table. It's the perfect place. Because it's not a table of judgment. It's us judging ourselves. Holy Spirit, show me as I go to the table of the Lord where His presence can meet me so strongly. Examine me. David said it this way in the book of Psalms. He said, examine me, Lord, and see if there's anything wicked in me. See if there's anything that's out of joint in me. See if there's anything in me, if there's any iniquity in me that I'm not even aware of. Those blind spots that everybody knows but us about us, right? Our kids know what they are. Our best friends know what they are. Our spouses know what they are. A lot of times we don't. Amen? Does that make sense? Holy Spirit, show me if there's anything that's an enemy to me, anything that's hurting me, anything that's destructive to me, anything that is limiting my relationship with you. The Holy Spirit's so faithful, and it's the perfect way. So Paul said, don't walk into this thing. Don't, don't allow it. Listen, he's saying don't allow it to become, <clears throat> pardon me, trivial. Now, what was happening, you've heard me mention before, is for them, for the church at Corinth, it was an entire meal that lasted for hours. Communion. It was an entire meal. But they were coming really hungry, and they had lost the significance. It became trivial to them. And so, if you read this first part of this, this passage, or, or before this passage, you read Paul telling them, what are you all doing? You're, you're drinking way too much wine. You're getting drunk. Okay, so you've completely lost the idea of what this is all about. And then some of you are coming starved like you hadn't eaten in a week. And you're eating all this food 
and there's a few of you that are eating all this food and others aren't even getting any food that's meant to be this communion sacred experience at the Lord's table and you guys it's become so trivial to you. you guys are just treating it like it's another meal like it's it's you're you're at some big buffet somewhere like some cafeteria it be, they had trivialized trivialized it and so that's why Paul was saying don't let it become trivial. So how does that happen in churches? We just do it. We just kind of go through the motions, right? Yes or no? Most of you in this room grew up the way that I did, or, you grew, or I grew up the way you did, however you want to look at it, where we grew up in a church where we did communion every Sunday. I don't know about your church, but in my church we did it every Sunday, and it didn't mean anything to me. I had no idea what I was doing. It would just become rote. It was just something that you just kind of robotically did. How do you realize that that's not what the Lord intended His table to become? It's a place for us to, to, for the presence of God to meet us, right, in a powerful way. So Paul says the way that you begin to really tap into that or experience that is examine yourself. Examine yourself. But here's the other thing that I want to look at that I think is a misconception that a lot of us have. And, and I, I want to, with the help of the Lord, try to clear it up. Because he goes on to say, after you know, we examine ourselves, he says, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. And then he goes on and talks about that's why a lot of you are weak. That's a lot of why a lot of you are sick. That's why some of you have died prematurely. And so the one translation or one understanding of that is that if you are going to the table of the Lord and there's sin in your life and, and, um, and you're, you, it, therefore you're eating and drinking in an unworthy manner, you're causing the judgment of God to come upon you and it can be so bad that you might even die. He might even take your life early. Okay. That's a misconception. Let me just settle this issue. It says, this issue here. It says, if any of you drinks in an unworthy manner. Let me just settle this issue, this question. Every one of us in this room are unworthy to come to this table. And on your best day when you feel like you've done really good today and you've read your Bible and you've been super sweet and kind and you didn't cuss at all or anything or whatever. I'm, you don't know. I'm not trying to be funny, but just whatever. And you just feel like, all right, I just, man, I'm doing it. I worship really good. You're still unworthy to go to the table. So let's just settle that issue. That word unworthy doesn't mean unworthy in the area of perfection or lack of perfection. That word worthy is actually it actually means the word weight. Weight. For example, back in this time, the weight of a coin is what gave the coin its worth or its value. Not to the numbers printed on the coin. It was the weight, like for us at the dollar bill, it's 5, 10, 20, there's a different value assigned to that, right? Right? In, the, in, 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 in Paul's time, it was the weight of the coin. And oftentimes, the longer the coin had been in circulation and the more it had been handled and passed from hand to hand and vendor to vendor and, and tax collector to tax collector or whatever, it would, it would, over time it would wear thin and the weight of that coin would lessen because of its use and it would lessen in its value or its worth. What Paul is saying to us to make sure we're not eating and drinking at this table in an unworthy manner. Literally what he's saying to us is make sure that when you go to the table, because you, here's what's happening. Again, they've been, they've treated it like another meal. Some of them are getting drunk. Some of them are eating more food than they should. Some people don't get any food. It's just this crazy meal. It's just this party. It's this big buffet. They've lost the meaning of it. So Paul says, make sure you don't Eat or drink from the table in an unworthy manner. In other words, Paul is saying that when you come to the table, ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand the weight 
of what Jesus did on that cross. The significance of his body that's been broken for us and his blood that's been poured out for us. Don't lose sight or sense of the weightiness, the value, the significance of what's happening at that table. That's what he means by eating and drinking in an unworthy manner. So that's why he went on to say that's why some of you are are sick. That's why some of you have died. And what he was basically saying is this. You went to the table. It was so trivial to you. You you ate from the table in an unworthy manner. Meaning you weren't reminding yourself that Jesus' body was broken so you could be healed. That his body was broken brutalized so that you could experience life and health that his blood was poured out so you could experience cleansing and strength and deliverance from sin and from your past so it's just so broken your heart many of you've died earlier than you should because you drank and ate in an un- what you didn't realize you lost the significance of the finished work of Christ amen does that make sense everybody and so paul is saying That's what he's talking about when he says don't eat or drink in an unworthy manner. And so I want to ask the worship team to begin to lead us. And I'd like for us to stand if we could. And I want to ask you, I want to encourage you to invite the Holy Spirit to meet you at the table, at at the Lord's table tonight. Invite and ask the Holy Spirit to meet you at the table. And ask the Holy Spirit to remind you of the significance, the weight Because that's what gives it the worthiness. That's what makes it worthy, right? Invite the Holy Spirit to show you and remind you that when we eat of that bread, it it represents this ultimate expression of love and of grace, this promise of healing, this promise of health, this promise of being made whole. And when we drink from the cup, invite the Holy Spirit to show you the power of the blood of Jesus that washes over you, that cleanses you, (laughs) that continues to cleanse you, that protects you, that severs the cords of evil. We were singing about shame. It's the blood of Jesus that breaks the chains of shame and guilt and sin and fear that we were saying. It's the blood of Jesus. So, Lord, Holy Spirit, as we worship you at your table, we invite you to speak to us. Reveal to us. Help us to recognize and see the worthiness, the weight of what's happening, the significance of the finished work of our Savior. And it is finished. He did everything he needed to do to provide for us everything we need tonight. There's nothing that needs to be added to what you did, Jesus. You paid it all. There's nothing left to be paid. The debt has been canceled. The victory has been won. That the power has been released. The promise has been fulfilled. You are here. Heaven has come to earth and heaven is still here by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you. Let's worship him. Let's celebrate those that are being baptized and let's worship him at his table if we could as the worship team leads us.